All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson. In this lesson here, we're going to be talking about another important group of tests for our critically ill patients, the hematology studies. These group of tests can give us a lot of useful information about the different components of the blood and help us to detect and identify really a wide variety of disorders. The information learned from these tests is often going to help guide treatment for patients in the ICU. So keep watching, I'm gonna break it all down for you guys. All right, all right, welcome back. So real quickly, if this is your first time here to the channel and you'd be interested in getting more critical care educational content such as this video here, I really invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. If you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications, that way you never miss out when I release one of these lessons. Now, when we're talking about hematology, we're talking about tests that look at the three major cells that form up our blood components. We have the red blood cells, white blood cells, and the platelets. The most common test that you're gonna be running is gonna be the complete blood count, or the CBC, also known as the hemogram. Now, there's a lot of very useful information that we get from just this single test, which is gonna help us, like I said, diagnose and treat many different disorders that our patient could be presenting with. Within this test, there are a lot of different values that we get from it, and so I'm gonna go through and talk about each one of those here. And the first of these that we're going to talk about are going to be our hemoglobin and our hematocrit, or our H&H. &H. Now, these tests are reported out separately, but are almost always evaluated in conjunction with one another. And so we'll start off and talk about our hemoglobin. Now, as we know, hemoglobin is a protein that is in our red blood cells that contains iron. It's this protein that helps to transport both oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the lungs to various tissues around the body. Therefore, the level of hemoglobin plays a really important role in our patient's physiological state. Now, interestingly, we have adult hemoglobin, which is structurally different than fetal hemoglobin, which I'm not gonna talk about here. I'm just gonna be specifically talking about adult hemoglobin. Now, it's important to know the normal values, and these actually differ between men and women. Now for men, the normal value is gonna be 14 to 18 grams per deciliter. And for women, the normal value is gonna be 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. Now, if our patient has low levels, that this is gonna be a nonspecific indicator of anemia. Some of the potential causes for this could be things like bleeding, either active or chronic. So here, think your GI bleed, injury, post-op, et cetera. Nutrient deficiencies such as iron, B12, and folate. Hereditary disorders like sickle cell, hemolytic anemia, et cetera. Chronic diseases such as the liver, kidney, and even cancer. And then some medications like chemo drugs, some antibiotics such as our penicillin group, and the antidepressant amitriptyline. And while we can see high levels, it's really not common to come across this. But cases where we do see this is typically in our patients with lung disease such as COPD or smokers who have fibrosis, uh, bone marrow disease, high altitudes because our body is trying to compensate for the decreased atmospheric oxygen, and then medications such as ivermectin, hydroxyurea, and interferon. And that's our hemoglobin. Now let's talk about our hematocrit. All right, so this value is going to be a measurement of the amount of red blood cells that make up our total blood cells. Now here for our normal values again, these also differ in men and women. For men, the normal value is going to be 40 to 50%. And then in women, this is going to be 37 to 47%. Now, this value of the hematocrit has to be evaluated in conjunction with what our patient's hemoglobin is. As a quick gauge, we expect to see a relationship of a 3 to 1 relationship. So, like for example, if you have a hemoglobin of 12, you should expect to see a hematocrit of around 36 to understand this relationship with hematocrit and hemoglobin and what it really means for your patient, I'm going to draw out a table here. And so here we're going to look at our hemoglobin, our hematocrit, and what condition this could possibly be for our patient. So if you're finding that both the hemoglobin and the hematocrit are low, 
then this could be hemorrhage or various causes of anemia. Now, if you're finding the hemoglobin normal but the hematocrit is low, that this could be the result of either pregnancy or overhydration. If the hemoglobin is normal but the hematocrit is high, then this would be the opposite, dehydration. And then finally, if both the hemoglobin and the hematocrit are high, then this could be one of those low availability of oxygen states. So again, think of the causes of high hemoglobin, COPD, smokers with fibrosis, altitude, those, those things. Now it is important to know though too that some medications can alter the hematocrit levels. So we can see increases in our patient's hematocrit with medications like clozapine, carvedilol, atropine, and cefoxetin. And then we can see a reduction in hematocrit with phenytoin, theophylline, enelopril, lasartin, and diprione. All right, so that's our hematocrit here. Now we're going to move on and talk about our red blood cells or our RBCs. And this here is a measure of the amount of mature red blood cells that we have in our blood. Now, just like hemoglobin, that this serves as a nonspecific indicator of anemia. And just like the last two, the normal values are going to differ between men and women. Now for men, the normal value is going to be 4.5 to 6 million cells per millimeter cubed. And for women, we're looking at 4 to 5.5 million cells per millimeter cubed. Now the big thing where the RBCs come in to really kind of help to diagnose what's going on with our patient is when we look at the various indices. And these indices are values that are going to give us specific information about the red blood cells such as their size and concentration of hemoglobin in each cell. Essentially when our hemoglobin and hematocrit are abnormal, that we want to use this in conjunction to help identify these specific causes of anemia. And so what we'll do is we'll go through and talk about these indices here. And the first one is going to be our mean corpuscular volume or our MCV. And this one is a measure of the average size and volume of RBCs. The way that we get this value is we take the hematocrit and divide it by the RBC. Now our normal value for this is going to be 80 to 100 per micrometer cubed. Now our lower values here, which means smaller average sides, is going to be our microcytic anemia. And our higher values, meaning larger average size, is going to be our macrocytic anemia. All right, next we're going to talk about the red cell distribution width, or the RDW. So this is a measure of the difference between the smallest RBCs and the largest RBCs. Essentially, this is going to be giving us a measure of variability. Now this, along with our mean corpuscular volume, is primarily used to determine the type of anemia. The way that we get this is we take the standard deviation of our MCV, divide it by our MCV, and multiply it by 100. Normal here is going to be 12 to 16%, with higher is greater variation in size and lower is lesser variation in size. Patients with a high RDW may indicate that they either have a nutrient deficiency or some sort of acute hemorrhage. And then the last indice that we're going to talk about is going to be our mean corpuscular hemoglobin, our MCH, which also has a close relationship to the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, the MCHC. So basically our MCH is going to measure the average amount of hemoglobin in each red blood cell. This value is derived by taking the hemoglobin and dividing it by the red blood cells. And here the normal value is going to be 27 to 33 picograms per cell. With this information, we can classify anemia based on color. This is a result of the amount of hemoglobin that's present. And here this can either be hypochromic, normal chromic, or hyperchromic. All right, so next let's move on and talk about the next type of cell in our blood, and that's going to be our white blood cells. So these white blood cells are present in the blood and are a part of our body's immune defense system. These can serve as nonspecific indicators of infection or autoimmune disorder. Now for this value, normal is going to be 4,500 to 10,500 cells per millimeter cubed. Now, increased levels, which is something that we call leukocytosis, is usually an infection and some malignant disorders such as leukemia. Decreased levels, or what we call leukopenia, is we see this with immunosuppression due to either disease or medication. 
And while certainly the, the value from just this specific test can be important if it's either high or low, it is important to know about our different differentials. This is important because there's five types of white blood cells, each with its own purpose and function. The differential gives us the relative proportion of each of the types of white blood cells, and depending on if they're either increased or decreased, can give indication to the specific underlying condition. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of these five types here for you guys. The first one we're going to talk about is our neutrophils. Now for our normal value for our proportional amount, we're looking at anywhere from 40 to 75% with an absolute value of 1500 to 8000. We can see decreased neutrophils in cases of radiation, chemo, certain infections such as rubella, measles, lupus, and typhoid, and we can see elevated levels in acute infections. The next cell we're going to talk about is our basophils, and here the normal value, our proportional amount, should be 0 to 2% with an absolute value of 0 to 200. We can see decreased basophils in hyperthyroid and pregnancy, and then elevated levels with leukemia, Hodgkin's, polycythemia, vera, and ulcerative colitis. Next, let's talk about our eosinophils. Here, the normal value proportional is going to be 1 to 6%, and absolute should be 0 to 600. We're going to see decreased eosinophils in stress due to trauma, surgery, etc., uh, as well as Cushing's. And then we can see elevated eosinophils in allergies, parasitic infections, some skin diseases, uh, as well as Hodgkin's and leukemia. Next is going to be our lymphocytes, and here our normal is proportional 20 to 25% with an absolute value of 1,000 to 4,500. We can see decreased lymphocytes with congestive heart failure, renal failure, and corticosteroid use. And then we can see elevated lymphocytes with certain infections such as TB, syphilis, and pertussis, autoimmune disease, and ulcerative colitis. And the last differential we're going to talk about is the monocytes. And here, normal value proportional 2 to 10% with an absolute value of 0 to 800. And then this, we can see elevated monocytes in some infections like uh, bacterial endocarditis, TB, etc., as well as autoimmune disease. All right, so those were the white blood cells and the different differential counts. The last cell that we're going to talk about, the third component here, is going to be our platelets. Now, like I said, this type of cell is found in the blood, and if you remember from the previous lesson that I did covering the coagulation studies and clotting, that they do play an important role in coagulation. Now, this particular test does measure the count of platelets, but it does not measure the function of those platelets. This actually requires a separate specific test looking at platelet function. Now, normal here is going to be 150,000 to 300,000 per millimeter cubed. And while the levels may be low and indicative of certain conditions, our patients really don't face the risk of bleeding unless this value is less than 50,000. Now, if we have decreased amounts, this is what we refer to as thrombocytopenia, and this can be the result of idiopathic thrombocytopenia, or ITP, nutrient deficiencies, bone marrow disorders, liver spleen disorders, as well as medications such as our neoplastic medications, amiodarone, and protonics. On the flip side, if we have increased levels of platelets, this is going to be our thrombocytosis, and this can be the result of anemia, some cancers, bone marrow disorders again on the other side, some infections, and then medications such as cephalozoin, lithium, micronazole, and meropenem. All right, and so that was our platelets, and that's going to wrap up the discussion here talking about our hematology studies and specifically what we're going to see and be able to interpret from our complete blood counter CBC. A lot of really good information here that you guys are going to see and use all the time in treating your critically ill patients. So again, really important that you understand what these tests are for, 
what the normal values are, and when you would expect to either see high or low levels of the results that you get here. I hope that I was able to explain this well for you guys. Uh, if you did and you liked this lesson, please leave a like down below, as well as share the lesson with someone else that you think might find it useful. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please do so as well. Uh, and leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave. I try to respond to just about every single one of them. Uh, sometimes it takes me just a little bit as I, I do get a little busy with work and, and life in general, uh, but I do try to respond to everybody on here. Uh, as always, a special shout out to our awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. Uh, the support that you guys continue to provide for me in this channel really is going a long way to helping me to do even bigger and better things for this channel in the future. So a big thank you to you guys. And a special shout out to Taleb Almari. Thank you so much for joining the code team and your support. I really appreciate you and your willingness to support this channel. It means the world to me. So thank you so much, Taleb. Now, if you guys would be interested in showing support for this channel, you can either join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out some of the additional perks that you guys get for doing just that. You can also support this channel through some of the links down below, as well as the awesome shirt designs that I have listed down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, feel free to check out a couple awesome lessons that I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.